All right, thank you so much, Katie. Again, good morning or afternoon, depending on your time zone, and welcome to today's Future Friday on Juris. My name is Dwayne Carey, and I will be your host for the next 45 minutes or so as we cover some of the basic information in Juris um, revolving around cash receipts and credit memos. Um, just a bit about myself, I am a trainer here at LexisNexis. I've been with Lexis since August of 2005. I started out originally as a tech support agent for a year and a half, and then I have been training ever since. I currently train most of our small law products, including Time Matters, Juris, Billing Matters, Counseling, and PC Law. So for today, we're going to look at the basics of entering in a cash receipt and a credit memo, but we'll also look at a few other things to do with those, like how you can identify a matter from a bill number um, when a bill is sent to you and you're trying to pay it, but you don't have any contact or client or matter information on it, how we can find that just from a bill number alone, um, how you can use the cash wizard to pay bills, how you can play just apply just partial payments to a bill as necessary. Um, so if you get one check in, you've got multiple bills, you want to pay a little bit on each, how we can do that. Um, how we can record a write-off recovery, so maybe someone has been written off, and then a couple weeks later you actually get a check in the mail, and now you want to pay that bill. Well, how we can record that write-off recovery and get it back into the system. How we can correct misapplied funds in jurors to a cash receipt. How to refund a prepaid, so if you close out a matter and they still have money left in the general retainer, how we can refund that money back to the client. And finally, how we can write off multiple bills for a client or matter at once. So with that, I'm going to jump into a Juris virtual machine, and we'll take a look at some of this information. So the first thing we're going to look at is just the basic cash receipt. Cash receipt is where you enter in the money you have received from your clients. Um, so when you receive a payment in, you enter that as a cash receipt. It's almost like doing a giant bank deposit in Juris. So to find cash receipts, we'll find those on your transactions and cash receipts. So we can double click to open up a new cash receipt, click on new to start a cash receipt, you can give the batch a new name if you like, or just leave the default that pops up. And then again, click new to start the cash receipt itself. You'll notice as we're looking through this, we've got the deposit date when we plan on dropping these funds off at the bank. Um, as we enter in the different checks that we received in the mail, we can enter in each check number, the date on the check, the amount of the check. There's a section for a payor, but usually if you've got a client who's paying an outstanding invoice, you can skip that, and when you pull in the client or matter you're paying, it'll backfill the payor in for you, so you don't have to type that in yourself. And then as you apply the money, you'll see it shrink here. You'll have a balance to apply from the amount that the check was written for, and as it gets applied, this should reduce this down to zero, and that's what you're looking to do as you apply these. Across the top here, you'll see four different tabs for entering different types of information into a cash receipt. You have the AR tab. This is where you're going to enter that information that uh, you got a check in and it's paying off an invoice, so we want to track that we're paying that invoice off. You will do that under the AR tab on your cash receipt. The prepaid tab, this is where you'll put in the prepaid funds. So if you don't use a trust account and you receive money in your operating account as prepaid balances for your retainers, this is where you'll enter that information in is under the prepaid tab. You may also use this tab if you're not using the trust account and they get an overpayment in. So they had an invoice of 500, they sent you a check for six, you'd pay the invoice for the AR tab, and you have $100 left over that you can put towards a prepaid amount that they've overpaid their bill that'll be applied towards their next invoice. For those of you who are using trust, this is where you can deposit those trust checks that you get in, whether the retainers are just refilling their trust amounts in Juris. Normally, if you are doing a cash receipt, you would separate your trust cash receipts from your other cash receipts for AR prepaid and other that are going to the general bank account, because generally those are going to do two different accounts at the bank, so you want to do them as two separate cash receipts in Juris, so you can track the trust in one and your rental general money in the other batch. Finally, the other tab, this is what you're going to use when you're getting non-client money in. So any money that's coming into the firm that has nothing to do with a client. So for example, you rent out some office space and your uh, clients pay you the rent for this month. You would enter that as non-client cash or the other tab and apply it to a specific GL account to have that money deposited. So that is the basics of a cash receipt. I'm not going to go ahead and create one just now, but we are going to look at some other things to do with cash receipts. So the next thing I'm going to look at is what if I get a check-in and I look at it and for whatever reason I can't tell from that check 
There's no information telling me what client or matter that's applied to. I can't tell by the name on the check, but I do have a bill number on that check. Somewhere in the little summary section on the check, they wrote in a bill number. As long as you have a bill number, you can find that information in Juris in your cash receipt. Again, just put in the deposit date, the check number that you got in the mail. Just put a random number in. The amount of the check, so let's say I got a check in for 650. Again, I can skip the payer section because I assume this invoice is somewhere in Juris and I'm going to find it for me. And then I can go down to the accounts receivable because it is a hopefully payment towards an outstanding invoice. And then just skip the client and matter information and put in the bill number that I have. So if that says somewhere on the check that I got bill number 59, I know it's a lower number for my database. And I just type it in. I can tab out and this point Juris finds, oh, check or invoice number 59, that belongs to the 0600 client on matter number one. So it'll find that information for me and then populates the payor with the ISOF slash general. And all I have to do is put in your payment, apply it, and I'm good to go. So if you get a check-in and you don't have any matter or client information on that check, but you do have an invoice number, then you should be able to track it down by just putting in the bill number itself, and we'll populate the client and matter for you. So we can do this whenever we get a check-in and we need to find a client or matter from an invoice number. Let me back out of that and create a new batch. All right, so this time we got some cash in. And uh, we know who the client and the matter is, but we just don't know what bills it applies to. So they, they gave us the check, um, they gave us an amount, we know who the client matters, but they didn't write on the check what invoice it was paying. One of the things you can do is use what we call the cash wizard on a new cash receipt. Again, put in the information from the check, again, just type in a check number. I will put in a check amount, let's say they sent us $5,000. Again, I could fill in the payor, but I can populate from the client and matter. So in order to do this, I can go in, put in which client sent me the check, in this case my 0500 client. I can leave the matter blank if they have multiple matters and I don't know what it applies to. But as long as I have a client number and the amount of the check that they sent me, up here I've got a little cash wizard icon I can click on. And when I click on that, It'll take a look and see if it's got any outstanding invoices for that client, find them, and then when it does, apply the money towards those outstanding invoices. So you can use this cash wizard when you're unsure which invoices are supposed to be being paid. Find that information, click on the icon, and we'll populate this information for you. Now this, this might be useful for some firms. Some firms your clients be a little more picky and want money to apply to certain bills. So the cash wizard may not always be the best choice. You really should communicate with the client if you're unsure where that money should go and apply it to how the client would like that applied to their outstanding invoices. But the cash wizard can be useful if you know they just want to apply it to their old invoices. The other thing to keep in mind, how it's going to apply is based on your firm settings in Juris. So it can either be applied one of two ways. It'll be applied either to the oldest invoice first, and then as long as there's more money, keep applying it to those older invoices. Or you may have it set up to apply to your disbursements or expenses first, and then fees second. So you get all your expenses paid off, and then whatever's left over will be applied towards fees. So that setting, let me cancel out of this. No. And you may not have access to this. It all depends on what access you have to Juris. But if you need to change that, that's under Setup and Manage. And that is under, let's see, we need to change our mode to Maintenance Mode to get to the section of Juris. Everybody should be logged out. So again, you should not do this willy-nilly in the middle of the day. Um, and it's under Firm Options, under Firm Options, under Transactions, Apply Cash Receipts By. So either type, expense, and fee, or it's going to buy the oldest invoice first. Again, if you don't have access to this, talk to your admin and they can check on that setting for you to make sure you've got it set up correctly. So that's how you can do a cash receipt and apply it when you don't know which outstanding invoices are out there by using the cash wizard icon. 
Next thing we want to look at is a partial payment. So I will go back to transactions and I will go into cash receipts and create another batch. We're going to enter a partial payment now. So in this case, I got a check from a client. Put in that information here. They sent us $500. Now down below, I'm going to go to the client, enter that information in. Matter two. Oops, forgot the zero. Matter two. And now I can control which one that's being is going to go against. Now, if I want to use the cash wizard to pull that information up, I can. There we go. We've got five hundred dollars already outstanding. Or I'm sorry, we got a little more than five hundred dollars outstanding. But they may have a dispute. They don't really want to pay off that full old invoice first, but they do want to pay a portion of it off. So we can go in and click on the apply section and click on this little zoom button, or also called the binoculars, and it should let me do a partial payment when it's going to cooperate with me. Let me just zero that out. Oh, come on, do my partial payment. I apologize, it's not cooperating with my Zoom. You know what? Because I'm using the wrong one. Let's try using the right one, the Zoom. There we go. Apologize for that. So this will pull up the invoice, and now I can apply the payments like I'd like. I can do it against just the build amounts here, or I can go to the fees or the expenses and make those payments there if necessary. So if I just wanted to pay $50 of this particular invoice, I could specify $50. And then I can do the same thing here as well. I'm sorry, it's not the binoculars, it's a little magnifying glass, wrong term. And I can make my applies here. And then I can apply it any way I like. So you can do partial payments that way, and you can actually zoom in and pay off individual fees or expenses as well, or just do a partial payment on the invoice. So here I've got my care. So if I had multiple timekeepers, I could decide how I want to pay each one and how much is being applied towards each timekeeper by using the partial payment with the zoom icon. Here, if I was just paying off a certain expense, I could choose that one expense I was paying. You have some choice how you want to do this. Normally, you're not going to pay fees first. You're going to pay your expenses and then fees second. So use that partial payment zoom icon to do partial payments in jurors and direct where the money is going to go on an actual invoice. And you close out when you're done. And normally, of course, you'd be saving these to be posted later when you're ready to post this cash receipt batch. If you make a mistake while you're entering information in, you can delete the information from the batch and create it as necessary. There's a couple things that you can do. So let me click on new and enter in a new transaction. Let's do 5,000. Now, let's use that as a check number as well. I'll go down, put in the client. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to pull in client. 410, I accidentally only client 400, and I don't realize it at first, but before I get to the bill number, I do realize, oh, that's the wrong client. It's supposed to be client 0410, not 0400. As long as your bill number is not filled in yet, you can click on this field and hit your function 2 or F2 key on your keyboard and zero out the field. Or you can hit control X and do the same thing. So as long as the bill number field has not been filled in yet, you can jump to these matter or client fields, hit either F2 or Control X, and delete the information that you put in if it's the incorrect information. Now, if you've gone in further, and I don't remember if they actually have a bill. They don't. So I'll use the one that I was going to do, 0410. Let's apply the cash wizard to pull that information up. 
So if I do pull it up, and I've already got the bill number in there, and then I realize, oh, that is the wrong client and matter. The F2 key or the Control X key are not going to work. So to remove that line to enter it incorrectly, click on the number next to the row to highlight the entire row. And at this point, you're going to go up to Form. And you can tell jurors to remove that row. So Form, Remove Row, deletes the information after you verify, yes, I do want to remove it. And now you can enter in the correct information. So if you've got the client and matter and you've entered that in and you haven't entered a bill number, F2 Control X will allow you to remove that value. If you've already selected the bill number, then highlight the row by clicking on the number next to the row, go to form, and you can remove that row of data. I don't have any. That's why it's grayed out at the moment. So that's how you can fix a cash receipt while you're in the middle of entering it and if you accidentally put in wrong information. Let's say that you accidentally did put some money in the system and you already posted it and it was for the wrong client and matter. So they've got prepaid funds on that client or matter and it was the wrong one, but you've already posted so we can't go back and correct it from there. You can do a correction batch to fix that. So let me close out of this. A correction batch should always be in its own batch. It should not be part of an existing batch. So I'm going to create a brand new one. I'm actually going to call this a correction batch. I can even include today's date if I want, just to make sure I know when I did this correction, or any information you want in this to let you know what this batch was for and what correction you made. And then create the new entry in the batch. So for check number, there's really no check number involved. I'm just going to type in correction. I'm changing and making some updates in the system. The check amount is going to be zero. By the time we're done, there isn't going to be anything where um, we've got a balance we have to worry about. We're just moving from one prepaid account to another. So we accidentally put money in one prepaid account, it should be on another. So it's going to zero itself out. So the check amount is going to be zero at this point. We're now going to click on the prepaid tax. We're moving prepaid money from one account to another. We're going to put in first the client who has money that's not supposed to that we entered incorrectly. So let's say I've got some money on my 0500 client on their matter zero. And let's say I accidentally put $1,000 there and it's supposed to be on my 0200 client. So I just put in, I need to take away 1000 so I negative $1,000. So I'm removing that prepaid from that matter. And then tab down and go down to my next line, and I put in the client who should have received that money. So it should have been on my Genco client in the general matter. Now I put in the positive 1,000 to offset the negative 1,000. And now I've got the money, and it will be moved when I post this batch. So it's a zero balance batch, but it's going to move the money from Mayfield to Genco. I save the information. Close out of the batch, and then when I'm ready, I can go ahead and post that batch. And I'll know which one to batch because it'll have a main correction batch. So the final step in any part of this is to post the batch, no matter what cash receipt you're working on. And that'll now move that money from the incorrect one of Mayfield to Genco. So I can easily move that money as necessary. All right, so we looked a lot at cash receipts. We're actually going to come back to the cash receipt, I believe, for my final thing for today. But right now, we're going to take a look at some credit memos. So a credit memo is used when you want to give credit back to an invoice, um, usually for maybe a courtesy discount. There might have been a dispute with the client about some fees. You're going to give them a discount on their invoice as well. To do a credit memo, you'll find that under transactions. And of course, there'll be credit memos here. Click on a new batch to create a new credit memo. Click on new again, and we have our credit memo screen. At this point, we now just pull up who we're giving the credit to. Um, I'll do it to Avent Technologies. Um, I'm giving a credit to their Avent Matter or my Avent Matter, so matter number two. And then which bill am I giving the credit on? If you don't have the bill number handy, you can hit the lookup, and it will show you the outstanding invoices you have for that matter and client.
So they had some dispute here on this bill number 77. They wanted a credit. We're going to go ahead and give them a $300 credit on this invoice. So I select the invoice I'm going to credit. I put a comment of what this is going to be. This is a courtesy discount. No, cap locks are off. I then put what I want to appear on the client's bill in the narrative. Courtesy discount per do timekeeper MAH. So client sees it on their line item, what that discount is for. Go to the summary and then put in the adjustment. You can either adjust the entire bill or you can adjust down the fees and expenses. So you can dictate who's going to get the hit if you have multiple timekeepers on the fees. Otherwise, you can just put in the adjustment and give them a $300 credit. And we'll now see that we'll take off that $300 and they'll now just owe us $3,000 on this invoice. I save it and I've created my credit memo. Once that credit memo is done, it's one of those transactions you don't have to worry about. It posts automatically. There is no posting of credit memos. So you don't have to worry about posting a credit memo. Once you save it, it is going to be complete for you. So that is your basic credit memo giving someone a discount. Now, I have had in the past when I'm training people who are on something with jurists, when they have to write off a client that has multiple matters or multiple invoices, they do a credit memo and they just write them all down with a credit memo on each invoice. There is a much simpler way to do it in Juris. If you have a client who's, let's say they declared bankruptcy, so they're bankrupting you of your uh, fees and now you just need to write them off, you still are going to the credit memo section and highlighting credit memos, but instead of creating a credit memo, you're going to go up to tools and you're going to write off multiple bills. So under tools, you can write off multiple bills for a client and matter. So click on write off multiple bills. You can put in the client here. Now, if you're just writing off one of their matters, you can then also put in their matter information. But if they have multiple matters and you're writing off all the matters, then just leave the matter blank and just have the client here. And then just click get bills. And it will pull up all the invoices that are outstanding for tech group in this instance. At this point, if I'm writing them all off, I just leave them all checked and I click write off and it writes off all the invoices in Juris. If I'm only writing off certain ones, then I can uncheck the ones I want to keep. There we go. Or check any others that I do want. In this case, they declare bankruptcy, I'm writing them all off. I keep them all checked. I click write off and Juris writes off the selected balances and I'm done. So though you can use credit memos to write off individual matter invoices, even if they have multiple invoices, if they've declared bankruptcy, the easiest thing is just to go up to tools and use the write off multiple bills and write off the multiple bills at once. Now let's say we've written off all of their invoices and all of a sudden out of the blue, oh, two weeks later, we get a check in the mail from Tech Group and they're actually paying off one of those invoices. At this point, I can't just enter the cash receipt and pay it off because in Juris, that bill no longer exists with a balance, so I can't do that. So we now use a credit memo to do a write-off recovery. So I'm going to add a new credit memo, click New. In this case, I'm going to call this a write-off recovery, just so I know what it is in the batch. Click on New, and now pull up a new credit memo. I'm going to put in that client who I just wrote off, Tech Group. But in this case, they actually did write it, the check to a specific matter, in this case, matter zero. So I do put in the matter this time. And then I enter the bill number. In this case, they wrote off bill. I wrote off bill number 54. Now I just put in the comment. This is a write-off recovery. Then put in what I want to appear on the narrative. And now I can just go to the summary. And instead of doing a negative adjustment, I can write this up with a positive 500 
to give that invoice a balance again. And if I want again, I can go in here. I don't have multiple timekeepers, so I don't have to worry about that. But I can write up whatever I need to. So I write it up for the $500. I go ahead and save that. And now that I've written it up, I should now be able to go into my cash receipts and pay that bill off. Four ten zero bill fifty four. Ah, I forgot the zero again. Four ten zero fifty four. And now the balance is back, even though I had written it off originally. And now I can apply my payment to that originally written off balance. So not only are credit memos used to give discounts to your clients as necessary, but can also be used if you need to recover a write-off so you can pay off of the invoice that was originally written off. So use the credit memo for write-off recoveries. All right. So we looked at what to do if you had prepaid funds that had been misapplied to the wrong client. Well, now what if we've gone ahead and we've closed out the case? So the case is done. They still have a balance left on that matter. So now I have to go ahead and refund those prepaid funds back to my client. How can I do that? Well, first thing we're going to do is let me close out of this particular batch and create a new one. And we can actually probably want to rename this batch, um, something like uh, prepaid refund, so we know which one this is. Because again, this one you're going to do outside your normal batches for uh, deposits. So give it a comment name so you know what it's for, and then enter a new batch. So in this case, we're going to go ahead and we're going to refund money back to our client on their prepaid account. So here I will enter the information as necessary. I'm going to do a zero check amount again. For the check number, I'm just going to do PPD refund for prepaid refund. Again, it's going to be a zero balance check. We just need to get the money to where we can cut a check out of our operating account. I can leave the payor blank, um, or the best thing to do is type in refund to client due to case closed or however you want to word it so you know why you're refunding the money back. Once you're here, you're going to go ahead and go to the prepaid tab and pull in the client you're giving the refund to. Oh, who do I want to use for this one? Who do I know has prepaid funds on it? I believe it is going to be oh, 500 so less some money left on there, if I remember correctly. And then put in the amount that we're going to refund. So since we're removing it from their account, we enter it in as a negative amount. So I think I have at least $500 on there, and that should work. We're good. If, there, if you didn't have the money there, jurors would throw up an error telling you there's not enough money. Um, I can probably replicate that easy enough. I tried to do 50000 there you go. They don't have that much money, and I can't go negative. So you don't have to worry about accidentally doing too much. Jurors won't let you. So I'm taking off the money that he had in prepaid. That will remove it from the prepaid section in Juris. Now I'm going to go to the other tab, and I'm going to put it in my operating account so then I can cut a check from the operating account to cut that back to the client. Now the GL account you want to use, make note of which GL account you're using. Um, you may want to talk to your bookkeeper accountant how they would like to handle the refunds. In my database, I've, I've got a 9,000 account um, just set up for a training that I use prepaid refunds. But you do want to talk that over if you don't already have an account set up, how your bookkeeper accountant wants to handle the refunds. The money's coming in and going right back out if you do this correctly. So this account, this prepaid refunds, should really be zero if I ever did a report on it because I should do the refund to it and then cut the check out so that account should always be zero. I'm selecting that account. The amount in this case is going to be the positive $500 I'm putting into my checking account so I can cut the check against it. So on the prepaid tab, oops, let me put in the reference first. Refund the client. 
So on the prepaid tab, I've got the amount I need to refund as a negative to take it off of their client matters prepaid. And then on the other tab, I go ahead and enter that amount in, reference refund the client as a positive amount. That puts the money into my operating account to refund back to the client. I save this, and then I make sure I post it. Again, since I actually changed the comment, I know which one it is, so it's easier to post. If I have multiple out there hanging out, that posts the refund. And the second step is just to cut a check with a quick check to pay the client back. So go to your quick checks, click on new to create a new quick check batch, put in the comment. This is a refund to the client 0500. Excuse my horrible typing and spelling. 0500. And now create your quick check. Which bank account should be your operating account if that's where its money's coming from? Then for your vendor, you can do one of two things. You can go ahead and create a new vendor for your client and put in the client information as a vendor if you want to keep that, a record of that in your vendor um, uh, mine just went blank in your vendor inquiry that's what I was looking for or if you don't deal with that client on a regular basis you only had one case you don't see dependency again you could do them as a temporary vendor as well so it's depending on how you want to track this information the temporary vendor just fill in the information. Uh, I'm just going to fill something in here. Save it. So now I'll have the check for my client. should be their client's name appearing on the check. Now I click on new to get my new quick check information. Um, the invoice number is just a prepaid refund. Then the invoice balance will be zero. The amount paid is going to be $500. Come on. No, i got to double click and open this up anyway, so I'll pop it up anyway because I need to go in here. Uh, da -da 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 -da. And you're going to have to do a GL distribution now to move the money from the GL account we did on the cash receipt out of that GL account. So now I go into my GL accounts. I use the same account I used on the cash receipt, in my case, 95.95 for my prepaid refund. And I do the $500 distribution to pull that money out. So I put the money in on the cash receipt. I pull the money out with a quick check. That's why my prepaid refunds. GL account should be zero because if I do this on a regular basis, it should just go in and out within the few minutes that I'm doing this transaction. Once I'm done, I've got that information in and out. I save my changes. If you don't have an AP account set up, Tritters is going to want one, so I will pull it on accounts payable. I go back out. I now have my check for $500. I now can go ahead and save this quick check. And I would then go ahead and print my check. And then I can send that back to my client. So that is how you take care of a refund for a prepaid. You start out as a cash receipt to zero out the prepaid amount in Juris. Put it into your uh, other tab to put it back into the operating account. Make sure you use the same GL account for that that you're going to use here on the quick check. Because with a quick check, you're now going to cut the check back to your client to refund them the money back. So that is a refund of prepaid funds to your clients. So with that, that takes care of a lot of the basic stuff you probably would want to know how to do with Juris for cash receipts and credit memos. So going back, here in the PowerPoints, I'll have some information about what we just covered in today's session for you to refer back to. I just didn't feel going back and forth between it would probably be a little confusing to me especially. So we'll have everything that I've covered today in this PowerPoint with some information for you to follow up on. And of course, we'll have this recording after the Future Friday for today. So some tips for the cash wizard. Again, if you're using the cash wizard and it's applying to expenses and then fees, you rather do all this invoice first. You need to change that under the firm options. Again, you need to put jurors in maintenance mode and then go ahead and uh, change it under transactions. Again, 
you may not have access if you're not the system manager. So if that needs to be changed, talk to your system, man system manager for jurors at the firm. Um, one of the other things you can do is you can enter the check number in the payer field to display it in the comment section of the client matter inquiry receipts tab. So if you're using that client matter inquiry quite a bit and you want to see the check number, you can enter the check number in the payor field when you do your cash receipt and it'll display it in the comment section on your client matter inquiry. When you are doing a correction batch, again, that should be the only thing in the batch is your correction. Do not put other information into those batches. It should be just that correction, finish it, and then post that batch when you are done. Again, the cash order should not be used to replace contacting your client if you're unsure how that payment should be applied. Talk to your client first, find out how they want that money applied, and then if, if it's going to be oldest invoice first, then just go ahead and hit the cash wizard. Um, otherwise, apply it as the client would like to see it in the system. Cash receipt batches can remain unposted throughout the day. So when you get checks in or you have people walking in and out with checks, when you do that cash uh, receipt, you don't have to post it immediately after you enter what you have in front of you. What you really should do is just keep entering cash receipts throughout the day into that same batch for payments. And then when you're ready to go to the bank, compare the batch balance to your bank deposit slip and when those match, you know you've got everything, and you can then post it at that point because now you're going to the bank to make that bank deposit. So as you're doing those batches, it does keep a running total in the batch. Let me go back to my machine real quick. So when I go to cash receipts and I open up a batch, so let's do this one. It keeps a batch total here at the bottom of the screen. So the idea is you just keep entering your batches in throughout the day, or I should say your cash receipts, throughout the day into this batch for the operating account. And then when you're about to go to the bank to make the deposit, compare the deposit slip total to your batch total. And those should match if you've been entering them incorrectly. Then once you know you're good to go, then close out, post the batch, go to the bank and make your bank deposit. That way you know everything's set. And it's better than creating and posting batches throughout the day because then it's a little harder to reconcile that with your deposit slip before you go to the bank because then you'll have to add the batch totals together. All right. If you want further information on training with jurors, you've got a few options available to you. We do do live instructor-led virtual classes in areas around the U.S. Um, if you go to LexisNexis.com slash university, you can look for those live instructor-led classes. We sometimes have them in Chicago, in our Raleigh, North Carolina offices, and you come and interact with one of our instructors. Um, we have, well, that actually should have been for the training on the second one down. The virtual classes are also on the university. Those are the ones that you can do from the office. They are done through the web, kind of like what we're doing today, but they're interactive. You will get a virtual machine that you can work with as you're going through the class. So you get hands-on practice through those virtual classes through the university. If you prefer to have someone come on site and work with you with Juris, you can also have one of our Juris consultants come. You can also find out our Juris consultants are also available, a list of them on the Lexis.com university. So you can have someone from our ProServe team come and help you with Juris and actually do customizations with you at the firm site. With that, is there any questions? Um, thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions that you can think of later before we end today's session, you can always email us at lntraining at lexisnexus.com and send us your questions that way. Um, that email address is available on the university as well. So if you don't have it from today, you can find it on the university. And with that, so thank you so much for your time. I hope you all have a happy holiday coming up, and I will pass it on back to Katie. All right. Well, thank you, Dwayne, for your very informative session. This does conclude the presentation portion of our webinar. As a reminder, if you do not have any, if you do have any questions for Dwayne, please feel free to ask them via the questions pane located on your webinar control panel. We already have some questions coming in. Our first question today um, is: I'm using 2.6. We have different bank accounts, and before I can do a deposit, first I have to go to tables and change to the bank. In future versions, is this different? 
Uh, that's, let me go back a minute here. So they're doing cash deposits before they do the cash deposit uh, because it's going by default to just the one bank account. It hasn't changed yet. Um, I will check in on that because you're right. If you've got multiple bank accounts you're doing that too, there's no no place to change the bank account. So you're, you're going into the SQL tables from the sound of it and making the adjustment there so it deposits to the right account. At this point, no. Um, I know there's 2.7 in the works. I don't think it's officially out yet. I don't think that's in 2.7, but I will check. Um, if you want, just shoot us an email at LN Training, and I'll get back to you if there's any plans on that. Because right now, I think that is the only way you can do it is through the tables. I can't think of a way because it just goes to that one account, and that's it. So for now, that's just the way it still works. But I will check on that with the developers for you. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, our next question is, I fill in the check date and the check number, but I don't see that information in a client's AR. Is there a report I can run that will show these fields? Um, the check number, like I said, what you can do to see it in a client matter inquiry is when you enter that cash receipt in. Whoops, that's an existing one that I posted. That's not smart. Let's open up a fresh one. If you put that information in the payor section, it will appear in the client matter inquiry. Um, so you could put the check number and the check date right here. So have the payer information and a couple spaces and put that information here and you can find that easily in the client matter inquiry report. Um, other than that, I can't think of a report off the top of my head in Juris that contains that by default. If you'd prefer to have it in a report, um, Probably someone on the ProServ team could design a report for you, keeping in mind that it'll probably cost you some money to have the report design. But the easiest way to do it is just include the check date and number in the payor, and then you can see it in the client matter inquiry without having to worry about customizations on your reports. Wonderful. All right, our next question is, um, you were using the 9595 account to refund PPD. To which account does your PPD deposit go when the cash receipt is made? Um, it goes to my general bank account. So if I do a prepaid uh, tables, chart of accounts. So when I do a prepaid, it's going into my do, 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 operating account, the 1001. When I'm doing that particular little switch, I just want the money now. You could have it go to this one. That's why I tell people, always check with your accountant and bookkeeper because they are going to have a particular account they want that money to flow through. Um, I just do it through the 95.95 so I can just, when I'm doing training, I can just refer to people and show them how it's working. But always check with your accountant slash bookkeeper. Find out how they want that money to go. They may want it to go directly through the operating account so they can see that money going through their reports. It really depends on who's looking at that data and who wants to see it and where they want to see it. So check with your accountant on that before you start using this an account you're unsure of. The only thing I can tell you is make sure when you do use an account, whether it's the operating account, the one that I created, the 9595, that um, when you do the cash receipt, you're doing the quick check from the same GL account. So it should always zero itself out. So check with your accountant. They're going to decide where they want it to go. Some people don't care. They're not looking at the 9595, and they can always run a quick report on it to see the prepaids rather than going through the cash. Other accountants want to see everything in that operating account. So check with your bookkeeper on that. They'll tell you where they want it to go. All right, wonderful. Our next question is, when doing write-offs, is there a report to show what was written off per month? Uh, inquiry reports, I'm not thinking. Off one off the top of my head. Let me just check what we got, if anything. Really, we don't have a write off report. Uh, let me browse it. Master lists, what's in there? I'm not thinking one off the top of my head. This might be one where. Um, if you email me at LN Training, I'll get back to you on. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's one. 
that would show a monthly write-off. Problem with trading three different billing programs and remember which reports in which program. And I'm trying to remember if Juris has one. I don't remember off the top of my head. Please email me at LN Training or email um, the Feature Friday and Katie will forward it to me. I will look into it for you and I'll get back to you on the write-off. I can't remember if Juris has one off the top of my head. I'll have to research that one real quick. And I should probably be able to get back to you either this afternoon or Monday at the latest if you email me on that. All right, wonderful. It looks like we have one more question. Um, okay. This question is, do you ever offer Oh, no, that's a Feature Friday question, so I can answer that one for her. <laughs> yeah, asking if we have Feature Fridays regarding bank reconciliations, which we absolutely do. So um, everyone be on the lookout for those emails. And that, uh, without any more questions, that concludes today's webinar. And I would like to thank you, Joanne, once again for your expert advice on today's topic. And to all of our attendees for taking the time out of your busy day to join us.